documentation to provide their residency status. And you really do need to ask everybody for ID so that you're not accused of discriminating against any particular type of tenant. Now, for somebody who doesn't have photo ID as a UK resident, I just recommend following the advice on the government website. There are pages and pages of advice and documents that you can use, so just go through there. Now, in vetting a tenant, we look at their credit score, we follow up their job references, and we also follow up their previous landlord references as well. In running a credit score on somebody, you need their express permission to run a credit check on them. Um, there are many organisations out there that you can use to run a credit check and they'll charge you all sorts of different amounts of money. It doesn't really matter, just choose one. Do make sure though that you understand the report that comes back. There's no point running a credit check if you don't read or understand the report that you get back. Because there's a lot of information to gather and to gain for person's authorisation to run a credit check, We've designed an application form that we ask tenants to complete, sign and return to us. Which brings me to another point. If you're collecting all this information on other individuals, you become bound by the Data Protection Act. This isn't just for big organisations like Talk Talk and BT and Tesco. If you're collecting information on another individual, you are bound by this legislation. It means you have a duty to confidentially protect that individual's information and not to share this unnecessarily with unrelated third parties. And if you decide not to go ahead with that tenant's application, you need to make sure you confidentially destroy their information. A final part of vetting a tenant is looking at people's Facebook profiles. Now, Facebook is different. It's not covered by the Data Protection Act because that information is out in the public domain and anybody can look at it. Most people have a Facebook profile these days, and most people don't have privacy settings set either. So you can have a look at all their posts, their friends, their photos. And again, this just helps give you a, a picture of the person before you. Okay, so now you have another tenant, you've checked all the references, you've got all the right documentation, now you can set up the tenancy. A few days before the tenant is due to move in, I'd ask them for the deposit and rent in full up front a few days before. Now, I do that, particularly for HMOs, because you won't believe this, but we have actually had tenants that have gone through all the credit checking process, they've agreed with their tenant to turn up, and then they simply haven't turned up on the day of the meeting. Um, so by asking them to pay up front, it shows the intent on their part. It also then gives you time to process their deposit. So you have a legal obligation to protect the tenant's deposits within 30 days of receipt anyway. By doing it up front, you won't forget at a future point in time. And also, you can then print out the prescribed information, take it along with the tenancy agreement and get them to sign it at the same time. And this will save you another journey at some point in the future. Do be wary of people that ask to pay cash on the day. Again, our experience of this is that people don't turn up with enough money. People don't realise, especially if they're foreigners to the country, there's a daily limit of £250 cash withdrawal at cash machines. You're then in a difficult position. Do you sign a contract with somebody who hasn't fulfilled their end of the bargain, which is turning up with the rent and deposit? Or do you turn them away and you might not have somewhere else to stay that night? So it's another reason for asking for the rent and deposit up front. Okay, we're still not quite there yet. There's still more to do. If at any point during the tenancy you feel you might want or need to serve a Section 21 notice, and for those of you who are less familiar, a Section 21 notice is a no-fault possession order to request your property back, you have to give the tenant certain documentation at the start of their tenancy. And it has to be the right information in the right format. This includes their signed deposit protection information, a valid EPC, a valid draft status certificate, and the government's how to rent booklet. And it does need to be the most up-to-date government booklet as well. They don't update it very often, but occasionally they do. So make sure you download the latest version from their website at the start of every tenancy. As best practice, at this point, we also like to send the tenants the, the inventory so that they've got it when they move in and they can spend time looking through it and making sure they agree with it. We also send them details of fire safety in the home, contents insurance, and for shared houses, the house rules. And the house rules is usually a subset of the AST, the Contra Tenancy Contract, 
And this is because most people don't read the tenants of contract. Ours is 14 pages long, and most people don't bother to read it. So what we've done is we've summarised on one sheet of paper the key clauses that they're responsible for. Now the big days arrive in ready to set up and sign the AST. I would meet the tenant at the property rather than just dropping the keys off or letting them pick the keys up from an office. This is so that you can again spend time going through the contract, making sure that they understand they're signing a legally binding contract. And you can also show them around the property. Remember all those things you checked before, the window locks, the shower pull cord, how everything works, um, where the meters are, where the stock tap is in case of a leak, and the will be a leak at some point in a shared house, we've already done. Um, um, this time up front will save you numerous phone calls and call outs at 10 o'clock on a Friday night when you decide you can't remember how to lock the front door properly or how the radiator thermostat valve works so they can switch the heating on in their room. So it really is worth the time at this stage. If you've got a single wet, at this point I'd go around to take meter readings and make a note of the meter reading on the tenancy agreement. It is technically the tenant's responsibility to inform the utility and the council of their new tenancy. But we find that either most people just say, yeah, I can't be bothered, because they don't want to pay bills. Um, if they're not English speaking, they simply don't know how to do these things. So we do it. At least then you know it's been done, it's been done right. And especially if the property's been empty, you're no longer responsible for those bills. Now, you're ready to hand the keys over. So, hopefully, this has been a quick whistle-stop tour, but a good insight into how to set up a robust tenancy. And hopefully, I've explained that setting up a tenancy agreement is a little more than just signing an AST. Okay, so, in the, in the, we've actually produced a manual which covers everything that I've talked about this evening. Um, and the driving factor for this is we've taken on a few members of the staff recently and tried to explain all of this to somebody quite difficult. So we've written it down step by step. Um, so if you'd like a copy, come and see me or Steve. Um, but here are my contact details. Sound a bit funny, but anyway. Um, there'll be time for questions later, but if anything comes to mind after this evening, then just drop me an email. Um, you can follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook and we'd be more than happy to see you on their sites. So I'll hand you back to Deborah. Thank you. <laughs> just a short networking break now. Um, just in case you don't get the property.